Allen Lund Company has new offices in Ogden, Utah, and Indianapolis, Indiana. Check allenlund.com to reach them. OOIDA, representing America's truckers since 1973, presents Landline Now with your host, Mark Redding. Two stories are dominating the trucking world right now, Hurricane Helene and the port strike. Mark Schremer of Landline Magazine stops by with some analysis. The rules for using your truck as a personal conveyance have been a source for conflict, with the enforcement community asking for limits while truckers argue for flexibility. Now, OOIDA has spoken out on the topic. I'll talk with OOIDA Director of Federal Affairs, Jay Grimes. It's safe to say that some truckers have encountered adverse driving conditions, and a regulation on the books gives them an option to deal with that. However, when can you use that? I'll talk with Tom Crowley and Aaron Lynch of OOIDA compliance department. And finally, California's governor is calling state lawmakers for a special session to address fuel price spikes in the state, something the legislature declined to address in its regular session. Scott Thompson covers that and more with our state legislative expert, Keith Goble. But first, the news with Scott Thompson. Thanks, Mark. We're going to turn to another Mark now to talk about the biggest story in trucking right now. Two stories, in fact, the impact of Hurricane Helene in several states and the impact of the International Longshoremen's Association strike at three dozen ports from Maine all the way down to Texas. The other Mark we turn to for details and analysis is Mark Schrimmer of Landline Magazine. Mark, good to see you. Yeah, thanks for having me. Before we get into the latest with uh, regard to the port strike, I wanted to talk to you about the situation throughout the southeast, the stories, the images coming out of of those areas post Helene are overwhelming, obviously yeah. tragic. Uh, you've covered a lot of these, I know, uh, these hurricanes and, and storms. Uh, just your thoughts as you look at the situation down there. Well, I mean, obviously, uh, truly uh, devastating. And, uh, you know, like you said, hearts go out to anybody who w- was involved in it, any of the people uh, that may have lost uh, homes, uh, lost loved ones, uh, um, you know, all of those type of situations. And then, and then, but, you know, covering these stories, obviously, from what we do, Often a lot of the focus goes on to those truck drivers. Um, I think, you know, I just seen a report where there was a driver on the first shipment got kind of got stuck in uh, North Carolina uh, for several days. And and now, um, you know, we're going to be turning uh, to those truck drivers to help supply uh, relief for, you know, the coming weeks and, and months. And obviously it has supply chain issues and, you know, all these uh, different various impacts. But, you know, we first you always have to turn to, sadly, the loss of life and, and the people that are uh, negatively affected by this. Yeah, and it's going to be a long time uh, in terms of recovery down there for several states and several areas. And as you kind of pointed out there, you know, truck drivers are a very giving community, uh, and they will continue to do what they can down in those areas to help and assist. 100%. And, uh, you know, carrying aid and, and whatnot. So we'll keep an eye on that, too. We do, uh, we should mention, uh, there are resources at laneline.media for Truck drivers, um, not just through coverage, of course, but uh, also for road closures and other matters as well. So um, keep it tuned to landline.media, the website there, for updates on that situation there with regard to Helene, which, again, is going to take some time to uh, for all, all of us to get past that. Uh, the double whammy here in the context of the supply chain uh, is this port strike. Right? Yeah. We, we've been talking about this all week. We spoke with uh, Jason Miller of Michigan State University yesterday. Uh, an expert, really, on all things supply chain related. We're not seeing, at least as far as I can tell, any dramatic effects yet, but yeah. it is just a matter of time, should this thing drag on, that we are going to see quite a few impacts all over the place, really. Yeah, and and, and seriously, no no pun intended on this, but it really is, when you talk about supply chain, the perfect storm of yeah. where, where you have with uh, the hurricane and now a port strike uh, on top of that, um, you know, I think they've seen some estimates. I think it was reported in the Hill. They're expecting this could cost the economy as much as five billion dollars per day, as long as the strike uh, continues. Um, already getting reports. You know, as we're in the the third day uh, of the strike, we're already getting reports. Um, you know, dozens. You know, forty some uh, uh, you know, shipping container vessels uh, lined up. Um, you know, thousands of uh, shipments going to the wrong 
ports. Mm-hmm. Uh, so we're having all of this. So, you know, they're, they're already talking that, um, you know, everything from uh, fresh fruit uh, to automobile parts, pharmaceuticals uh, could all be affected by this. There's a lot of, I think, uh, Walmart uh, shipments that, that are loaded up. So you think about a place that where everybody gets their everything, you know, yeah. places like there. Um, so, uh, you know, it's definitely expecting uh, there to be uh, some major supply chain effects. Um, we have, you know, and we're, we're not that far away from the pandemic where we, we saw this. And we saw, um, you know, the first time in my life going to a grocery store and seeing empty shelves, uh, you know, type of thing. And I'm not trying to say that that's what's going to happen yeah. here uh, of putting the same thing. But, but I think that probably you know, is, has everybody reeling and kind of nervous because it wasn't that long ago uh, what they remember what that was like and remember, am I, am I going to have enough toilet paper? Is they're seeing, you know, the, the four rolls down to three and, yeah, yeah. and, 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 you know, not able to buy one. So, uh, I don't think that we have that yet. I'm not, you know, no. like, not trying to, uh, be chicken little or anything like that, but it's definitely on the thoughts, you know, of everyone. Well, and we're not far away from it either. Uh, you mentioned we're not far away from the pandemic. We're also not far away from election day. And I've seen some discussion of this. I don't think it's necessarily been talked about enough uh, that there are going to be political implications of Under, this. Yeah, definitely. Uh, as you've got the two sides, the ILA uh, and their, you know, their uh, employers, essentially on the other side of the matter here. The White House has kind of said it's not going to step in. Yeah. President Biden does have the authority to enact or invoke something called the Taft-Hartley Act which would force workers back to the job while negotiations continue. Yeah. Uh, I'm not in the prediction business, but I would uh, expect that that conversation is going to heat up over the coming days if it looks like this thing is going to drag on. Again, with yeah. the eye on November 5th, because that is going to be a big talking point leading up to that. Yeah, and I believe that you know that act hasn't actually been utilized since uh, George W. Bush was mm-hmm. president, yep. so it's been a, been a little while. You know, so far what's coming out from the White House and uh, Department of Labor, uh, uh, Julie Sue, it's basically what they're saying is you know they're kind of so far kind of on the side of the workers, saying that these uh, places have had record profit. And some of that that money should be going down uh, to those dock workers, and and uh, so that's where they're at now. But as you said, as the days go on. Uh, to this, it, it will be interesting, uh, and it, you know it may ultimately, uh, you know, be to the good of you know the American people yeah. in general uh, to do this. so. Um, yeah, uh, I, I would think we're probably a little ways from that for him to do in a complete about face, but that's you know I don't think it would take that long to at least that question start getting a little more, you know, the the dial going a little bit higher. Yeah, I think if we're sitting here next week at this time uh, and no agreement has been made, I think you're going to hear a lot of lot of conversations about that act being invoked and, and enacted there. Uh, but again, we will see. Time will tell. Uh, we live in a crazy world, Mark. <laughs> we appreciate you coming by and uh, putting some clarity on the situation yeah, for us. Yeah, always happy to be here. And we'll do our best to stay on top of both topics as they progress. Landline.media is a place to go for coverage and, of course, right here on Landline Now as well. Mark, thank you for your time. That was Mark Schremer of Landline Magazine. I'll toss it back now to our other Mark. Back to you. Thanks, Scott. T.A. Petro is accepting nominations for its annual Citizen Driver Award. Winners have a T.A. Petro location named in their honor. You can make a nomination at citizendriveraward.com. The deadline is October 7th. Starting October 12th, Marty Ellis and OOIDA's tour truck, The Spirit of the American Trucker, will be at the ATHS Yellow Rose Truck Show. That takes place at the J.B. Wells Park Pavilion in Gonzales, Texas. Stop in, say hi to Marty, and join OOIDA for a $10 discount. Next, I'll discuss personal conveyance and other regulatory guidance with OOIDA Director of Federal Affairs, Jay Grimes. I'm Mark Reddick, and this is Landline Now. Thanks for listening. Be sure to like and subscribe. If you want more content, go to landline.media to get updated news, information, and archived editions of our show. Once again, that's landline.media. Control your toll costs and eliminate tolling headaches with prepass tolls. Prepass tolls means toll volume discounts. Just one invoice for all tolls and fewer violations. Call 877-878-5970 or go to prepass.com. 
Are you tired of the IRS following you around like a dark cloud? Call 888-557-4020 and get your life back. At Truck Stop, we've built a better load board for carriers like you. Sign up today and access over 600,000 loads on the most trusted online load board. Learn why the best in the business rely on Truck Stop to make more money and start driving your profit today. It's tested and proven. Burn 2.1% less fuel when you balance all wheel ends with Centromatic. Call 800-523-8473 to get the OOIDA discount. The rules for using your truck as a personal conveyance have been a source of conflict, with some in the enforcement community asking for specific limits on the practice, while others among truckers argue for a more flexible interpretation. Now, OOIDA has spoken out on the topic. Welcome back to Landline Now. This is Regulatory Roundup, and I'm Mark Reddick. I'm joined, as always, by OOIDA Director of Federal Affairs, Jay Grimes. Uh, Jay, before we get into the latest news on this, this is in response to an FMCSA request for comments, uh, but not specifically on personal conveyance. What was the nature of this request? Uh, Yes, this was a a request for comment that the uh, agency is required to undertake uh, every five years on a a review uh, of guidance documents. And uh, these guidance documents are generally clarifying information, uh, response to questions that to help industry stakeholders uh, interpret the federal motor carrier uh, safety regulations. Um, and as required by the, the FAST Act that was passed back in 2015, FMCSA has to conduct a, a comprehensive review of the guidance documents uh, to try and help them uh, ensure that the guidance documents are, are consistent and clear uh, and uniform. So kind of uh, an open invitation for, for public comment on a number of guidance documents that the agency has put out over the years. Uh, there are currently over 1,300 uh, individual guidance documents, but, uh, you know, we wanted to take an opportunity to highlight uh, a few that we like, some that we don't like, and maybe give suggestions on how kind of FMCSA can perhaps improve the, the kind of overall guidance process. And, and as you mentioned there, referred to OOIDA as focusing on just a few areas in its comments of this regulatory guidance. Um, I'm wondering if you can give us an idea of what the areas are, just uh, to start off, just identifying what they are, the areas that OOIDA chose to comment on. Well, certainly uh, this gui- a guidance document that was uh, released a few years ago by FMCSA uh, it really provides uh, a definition uh, of under what circumstances may a driver operate CMV as personal uh, conveyance. And in this guidance, FMCSA stated that uh, a driver may record time operating personal conveyance for personal use uh, as off-duty when the driver is relieved from work and all responsibility for performing work by the motor carrier. Uh, the CMV may be used for conversal personal conveyance, even if it is laden, since the load is not being transported for commercial boner benefit. And then they went through and, and kind of you know, answered a, a few different questions and clarified some technical details. Um, one thing that we were uh, supportive that FMCSA did not include in this guidance was any mileage or time limits for the use of personal conveyance. And that has been a kind of a, a source of debate throughout uh, many years. Uh, we have always protected the use of personal conveyance without having any mileage or time limits. Many small business truckers, uh, you know, their their commercial vehicle is also their personal vehicle, can be their uh, home away from home in, in a lot of cases uh, as well. So we don't want to have... Uh, OIDA member or trucker uh, be limited into how they can use their their personal uh, vehicle or your their personal time when they're off duty. Um, in opposition, the Commercial Vehicle Safety uh, Alliance, representing law enforcement, has petitioned the agency, has petitioned FMCSA over the years to uh, implement uh, mileage and time limits. And um, thus far, FMCSA has denied those petitions and has not placed any uh, mileage limits on personal conveyance. And we wanted to uh, ensure that is the case moving forward. And that's what we highlighted in our comments, uh, you know, supporting the guidance that the agency put back in 2018, noting that it provides drivers with more flexibility during their daily operations and that 
for small businesses, the truck functions as a personal vehicle and maybe their only means of uh, transportation of any kind. So uh, really want to make sure that the, the guidance put out by FMCSA is maintained and is is not amended uh, to include any uh, limitations going forward uh, and urge the agency to uphold the guidance and protect the use of personal conveyance in the future. Now, the next area of OIDA's comments centered on the Certified Medical Examiner's Handbook. And this is an area where the difference between regulation and guidance has really become a central issue. Can you explain what's been happening there? Yeah, right. So uh, about a decade ago, uh, FMCSA put out uh, with a certif- an, an initial certified medical examiner's handbook. And the goal of this document was uh, to provide uh, educational resources to certified medical uh, examiners who are conducting uh, the medical card examination uh, for drivers. And that initial handbook was very flawed in that it uh, you know, included a lot of inaccurate information at times and a lot of misleading information at times that, uh, you know, resulted in uh, CMEs kind of strictly relying on on guidance that hadn't been approved uh, in the rulemaking process. It was very unclear and gave, I think, too much leeway to certified medical examiners um, to kind of interpret guidance rather than the medical regulations uh, that have been approved by FMCSA. So over the past, I think it's been five or six years, uh, FMCSA, along with the Medical Review Board, put out uh, a number of different public comment periods kind of uh, amending and updating the Certified Medical Examiner's Handbook. They put out a, a new edition uh, in January of 2024. In most cases, the updated handbook uh, better distinguished between regulation and guidance than the preceding version, really clarified that the, the handbook itself is, is guidance, cannot be relied on in terms of, of regulation. But uh, a couple of the sections, I think, were still a little included, a little more gray area than we were hoping for, uh, specifically uh, a section on obstructive sleep apnea that we believed still remains overly reliant on recommendations that were put out by the Medical Review Board uh, in 2016. And those recommendations, I think, empower medical examiners to continue to force these needless sleep apnea screening and tests on drivers, those 2016 recommendations really would uh, automatically place a a driver into apnea testing uh, if they just had one qualifying factor, whether that was an above average uh, body mass index, uh, a certain neck size, um, and really stuff that, you know, almost an overwhelming majority of the industry would, you know, automatically get thrown into a, a, a costly test that a lot of times is not covered by health insurance, is not covered by motor carriers, and really places a lot of economic and time burdens uh, on drivers. And, and and we've been adamant that the recommendations from 2016 should not be included in the in the new handbook, which they they still are. So that is one of the things that we reiterated, reiterated to the agency in this guidance review, um, kind of explaining that many drivers kind of still have to undertake the time-consuming process at the behest of medical examiners when drivers should instead be relying upon their personal physicians who have a better understanding of their medical history. Um, so again, uh, there's no regulation uh, for sleep apnea screenings. There's no requirements. Uh, and in fact, it's a law that uh, FMCSA, if they want to uh, put in any requirements, has to go through uh, the formal rulemaking proceedings. And this handbook did not really um, do that, especially those 2016 uh, recommendations from the Medical Review Board. Well, let's move on to uh, what I think is maybe the last topic, or no, it's second to the last topic <laughs> that's covered here. ELDs are electronic logging devices. And uh, yep. boy, we could go on and on about this. Yes. But what in particular is the issue that OOIDA pointed out in these comments? Right. So uh, back when uh, the ELD mandate first went into effect, which obviously we have a number of concerns with and and fought it tooth and nail, still continue to oppose the mandate and and want to see it repealed. But FMCSA uh, put out a a guidance relating to pre-2000 model year 
uh, exceptions. And uh, the guidance that they issued in, in 2018 states, uh, it clarifies uh, that if the model year reflected on the vehicle registration is not the same as the engine model year, that the, the older engine registration uh, does apply. So if you've got uh, maybe a 2000 uh, year uh, model model year truck, but uh, a glider kit or an older engine, pre-99 engine in that truck, you are exempt from the ELD mandate. And uh, we think this has helped drivers who have uh, relied on glider kits to kind of, uh, you know, be in use of the glider kit and have that older model year engine uh, apply when it comes to ELD compliance. And this is held up since the ELD mandate uh, went into effect. Uh, however, uh, in 2022, five, about five years after the ELD mandate was implemented, FMCSA was kind of taking a look, looking at some uh, revisions to, to perhaps uh, in, improve the rule. And they specifically asked about that pre-2000 guidance. And, and we want to make sure that this guidance document uh, is upheld as well to, again, uh, give drivers who, who like their older trucks, who like their older engines, they continue to use them if an ELD is not compliant uh, with that vehicle or if they're outside of the, the scope of the mandate. And uh, FMCSA is still reviewing uh, that ELD revisions uh, advance notice of proposed rulemaking, but we want to make sure there's no changes to that pre-2000 uh, model year exception. We've got a little bit of time left, and I do want to get to this last one because it's one that really stokes some very strong emotions of the trucking industry, and that is broker reform. Uh, and the central point is broker transparency. There is regulation on the books right now regarding that. Um, what does it say? Yeah, so uh, 371.3 uh, subsection C specifically is expected that uh, brokers have to pro uh, provide uh, transaction information and transparency to motor carriers when the motor carrier rec requests that. However, uh, this regulation has never uh, never been adequately enforced. We know brokers find ways to kind of uh, work around it, find loopholes to, to kind of wink, wink that they're in compliance, but make it very difficult for motor carriers to ever uh, you know get that transaction information. But you know, the, for years now, and really going back to 2020 when OIDA filed a petition to ensure broker transparency, FMCSA has acknowledged the need for more broker transparency. Uh, in the spring of last year, they said that they were going to move forward with the broker transparency rulemaking. We are still waiting on that uh, notice of proposed rulemaking, uh, which, you know, is expected to be out this month, and, and we're kind of uh, still anticipating that it will be. However, if the agency continues to kind of, um, you know, take their time on putting this rule rulemaking out, we think maybe a, a, a guidance uh, could be necessary to, to kind of help with enforcement of compliance of 371.3. Going through those 1,300 documents, there's very few uh, that apply uh, to broker regulations uh, in general. We could also uh, you know, look forward to guidance that relating to, to Regulation 370 to exp expedite the claims process between motor carriers and brokers as well. So until we see a, a final rulemaking on broker transparency, we, we've encouraged FMCSA con to consider issuing in guidance that can improve compliance with 371.3 as well as um, 370. Because uh, in a lot of cases, uh, these guidance documents can be helpful uh, in terms of making sure the, the federal motor carrier regulations are being enforced with and complied with the way that they are intended to which in our interpretation, 370 and 371.3 you know, really aren't doing that at the moment. Well, Joe, we've run out of time, but thank you very much for all the information. We sure appreciate it. All righty. Thank you. I've been talking with OOIDA's Jay Grimes. We'll be back in just a moment. I'm Mark Reddick, and this is Landline Now. Penske owns and operates some of the best-maintained vehicles on the planet. Our used trucks come with a five-year maintenance report and pre-sale inspection. So if you're in the market for a top-quality pre-owned truck, look no further. Search our inventory today at PenskeUsedTrucks.com. 
Capital Reman, the leader in remanufactured diesel engines and components, has partnered with OOIDA to offer exclusive member benefits. Visit CapitalReman.com today to support America's transportation industry and take advantage of your benefits. When it's time to overhaul your truck engine, help protect it by insisting on a genuine Vibratech TVD crankshaft damper. Heavy duty, absolute premium quality, and they're made right here in the USA. Find a dealer at VibratechTVD.com. Landline Now, welcome back. It's safe to say that in the recent past, some truckers have encountered what could be called adverse driving conditions. And there is a regulation on the books that gives them an option for how to deal with that. However, when can you use that option? Under what circumstances and for how long? Here to offer some answers on that and more are Tom Crowley and Aaron Lynch of OOIDA's Compliance Department. Guys, how are you doing? Good, Mark. Pretty good, Mark. Always good to be here. Well, glad to have you here. And of course, uh, especially in the Southeast U.S. right now, this is very pertinent. Um, So let's talk a little bit about this adverse driving condition exception to the hours of service. First of all, um, can you explain what that is, what it says in the regulations? Yeah, Mark. Um, For adverse driving conditions, it means snow, ice, sleet, fog, or other adverse weather conditions or unusual road conditions or traffic conditions that were not known or could not be reasonably be known uh, to the driver immediately prior to that day's duty. Um, So that's that's the that's kind of the catch there. Is it forecasted? You know, if you check the forecast or if dispatch checks forecast and could reasonably know it was coming like a hurricane, that's one of the issues. You kind of run into issues there using it because, you know, you could see it was going to happen. Now, if something unforeseen, you know, say you're up in up in the mountainous area, you know, and they get that uh, hail storm that comes down and maybe maybe some freezing rain, something that was not forecasted, that definitely could be used. Well, and I would wonder, too, with this particular hurricane we've just had, um, I think people predicted the hurricane. I don't know that anybody predicted massive flooding washing out major interstates 300 miles inland from the coast. That is true. That is that is a real good point. Um, And and that was not something that's predicted. I mean, yeah, right right along the shoreline. Yeah, you'd have issues. But that surge of water, that that push, I think it would definitely fall under that, uh, you know, because you. You didn't know that morning when you were taken off that that was going to happen. Okay. Or, you know, what morning, evening drivers, you know, 24-hour clock. Let me interject here. A lot of that, though, as far as that goes, average driving conditions, doesn't really apply to natural disasters per se. A lot of your states will have emergency declarations at that point that will exempt you from hours of service to begin with. Yeah, but don't some of those restrict it to people that are providing direct aid for relief? They do. They, they, they do. They do. They do usually have that, you know, uh, direct response, you know, FEMA stuff, uh, stuff like this. Um, but that is a good point, you know, because like Florida, you know, they declared a national disaster, which which did exempt uh, drivers from a lot of the regulation. Not not all. There's, there's still some that most in place, but there's definitely some they're exempt from. Now, as I recall under this regulation, if you do encounter adverse conditions that qualify under it, you get two extra hours to drive, as I recall. Yeah, it, and that was something that here, what, a year or two, they had just kind of updated um, to where you do get the additional two hours of on-duty or driving time. Previously, it was only on-duty time, but now you do get the additional two hours to drive, and that's that's a big help. That could be a big help. Now, if you're going along and you've got these two extra hours and you are able to get out of the area or past the adverse conditions before the two hours is up, do you still get to use the whole two hours? Because I know someone's thinking that. <laughs> no, drivers are not pushing the envelope. Um, yeah. Now, once you're once the condition no longer exists, you know, you need to find a safe place to park and 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 do your 10-hour break or, you know, whatever whatever you've got coming. Now, how do you log this on an ELD? Because that, of course, has, <laughs> since we went from paper logs to ELDs, they don't all have a place built in to do this kind of thing. What do you do? Yeah, it's not a one-size-fits-all answer. A lot of the ELDs nowadays, you got a comment section or a note section where you would notate 
in there that, you know, adverse driving conditions may have a place where you can put um, the location, times, things of that nature. Um, but it's not a one size fits all. Different ELDs will will have you do different things. And some of them I don't even think have adverse driving conditions or a comment section period. So when something like that transpires, you need to notate it somewhere on a log as well. Okay. So let's get into some of the technical things here. There is still the 70-hour the rule, that type of thing. Do you still have to follow those rules? Does that expand by two hours? No. The 70-hour rule would still remain the same. I mean, the adverse driving condition only affects the 14-hour rule and the 11-hour driving. It gives you an additional two there. It doesn't address the 70-hour rule. Um, and, you know, and, and it, it doesn't... Uh, I mean, it's not a carte blanche, go do what you want to do. You know, you, you still have to keep it reeled in, and you may have to answer to DOT roadside within the next seven days, and they'll take a look back at your logs and see what you've done. You want to be able to answer for that, and it's kind of the same with personal conveyance. People get hung up on that. They think they can do what they want, and then they have to answer to it within the next couple of days if they get pulled over, and, and it goes bad. Now, Aaron, you mentioned uh, annotating the logs, putting some comments in there. What sort of information should you include in that comment uh, to make sure that you're covered in this situation if you take the adverse driving condition exception? The things that I would cover in there is I would notate it as adverse driving conditions. The times that you actually utilize that, if, given that you're not going to use all of the the two hours, I would notate how long, whether it's 46 minutes, 22 minutes, whatever the case is. And then I would notate what that adverse driving condition was, whether IE was strong winds, tornado, um, a car accident, a 15 car pileup, you know, things of that nature. I would include that and, and as well as the location or the coordinates that you're at. Uh, Tom, uh, you mentioned, of course, that people may have to face the music if they do this incorrectly. What sort of consequences would you face if you misuse this and you get caught? Well, if you misuse it that day before you've had a 10-hour break, you'll be placed out of service. I mean, you know, because you will have violated the hours of service. Um, if you misused it three days ago, well, I mean, you know, you will definitely get a write-up on a DOT inspection report which people know how those can affect you. And, uh, you know, you could possibly get a fine depending on the state. You know? Okay. So there's there are definitely some things to consider before you invoke one of those exemptions. Okay, something to keep in mind because apparently hurricane season is not over. We've <laughs> already got something developing in the Gulf of Mexico. So folks, keep an eye on the weather reports and be careful out there. Let's move on to another topic uh, that you guys had mentioned in an email earlier is is coming up quite a bit, and that is people who are selling or transferring their operating authority or their MC number. Uh, and this – I hadn't heard of this before just the past year. This suddenly kind of cropped up on my radar. Is is this something new completely or is this something that's been done in the past? Well, it's, it's not new. It hasn't been done – near as frequently as it has been in the last couple of years. It's something that, um, you know, you, you have the ability to sell your business. Um, you can do that. That's legal. It's just with the the current market conditions and, you know, the uh, all the fraud that's been going on in, in the industry, um, it, it's become much more popular. And, and folks right now, you know, there's – unfortunately, there's a lot of small – small, just a couple of truck carriers that have went belly up. I mean, you know, it's freight rates about where they're at, uh, you know, the market, the way it is, um, overcapacity of trucks, or it's it's kind of scary out there. Well, there's been a lot of folks go out. And as their uh, authority comes up on the FMCSA website as, uh, you know, that their insurance is going to lapse and it shows that they're going to go out of business. Well, you know, there's places out there that are cold calling, they're emailing, they're, they're trying to get a hold of these folks to buy their authority. And it's not always it's not always what you want to do. You, you just definitely want to consider what what could happen when you do this. So give us an idea here, uh, guys. What could happen? What, what have we seen that basically qualifies as a problem that has come up when people have done this recently? Well, I mean, you know, the identity theft 
comes in here because, uh, you know, is what they want to do is they want to come in and buy your authority for a couple of thousand dollars, maybe, you know, um, they, they want it. They say, you know, they want the aged authority, so on and so forth. Um, the, and so they come in and they buy it, but they don't just want your authority. They don't just want your MC number. They want your pin number. They want your email. They want everything so they can assume your identity. And when they come in and assume your identity and then they, based on your good name, they start booking loads and those loads start disappearing or they don't get where they're supposed to be or they've been double brokered out, then you start getting calls. Um, and people say, hey, where's my load at? And you're like, whoa, what, what, what's going on here? I mean, it, it can really kind of sully your name and, and just bring you a lot of headache. So it's, it's just not all that it's cracked up to be. Well, and let's keep in mind, you can sell your MC number. You can't sell your DOT number. The feds don't allow you to sell your DOT number. And the DOT number is where the actual value comes in because that is what has your actual equipment listed, right? And that's where the value of your business is, is the equipment, is the contracts that you have, is the connections you've made. That's where the actual value is. Your MC numbers, honestly and frankly, it's not worth much. And all they're doing is trying to get that aged MC number to either be able to get a head start in the game or, like Tom said, in a lot of cases, what you will see is not only do they want your MC number, but they want to retain all of the information that's public. So they want your phone number. They want access to your PIN number, things of that nature. And when they do that, your name's still on there. You've sold that MC number for $4,000. You think you made out like a bandit. Great. Come to find out in three months, they've booked all kinds of loads, and they're over somewhere, you know, in Eastern Europe or in the Middle East, and they've essentially ruined your name and, and racked up a ton of costs associated with you. You're on, on all kinds of different forums like a like a watchdog or like a, a carrier or sure or, or all these other places that have you as, as booking stolen loads and now you get phone calls or you get emails or, or frankly you may even get somebody as far as, as sheriffs or, or, or cops knocking on your door. You know, it can get that bad. And that's something that you can never recover from because your name's always attached to that that MC number. That does sound like a real problem and, and certainly uh, one you want to avoid. Uh, Tom, you mentioned a term earlier, aged authority. And that, I think, is one of the keys here. Um, we just got a little bit of time left, but I'm wondering if you can explain what that means and why it is these people buying the MC numbers or buying authority want that aged authority. Well – the aged authority is something that really brokers have bought that about by telling carriers, hey, we won't load you unless you've been around six months or 90 days, what, you know, whatever their criteria is. And so it's come to this aged authority issue. Um, it's, it's not anything that the Fed's put in place because you have your authority. You're, you can go. But um, it, it has been brought around with the brokers. And so these, these scammers, rather than having a new authority brand new that a broker won't load – they want your aged authority because then they can just step right in there as in their you. And, and like Aaron said, they can work off your contacts, work off of your name that you've built and get that aged authority, start hauling freight and making that stuff disappear overnight. And a lot of these other assuming parties, shippers or brokers, won't even know that a transfer has taken place. They'll still think it's you and you've been in business eight years. And let me say, too, the feds are coming up with they, – they know this is a problem and they're – Coming up with some plans or some supposed solutions, we'll see what happens. Okay, great. Well, guys, a lot more we could talk about on this, but we're out of time. Thank you very much for the information. Glad to help. Thanks as always, Mark. I've been talking with Aaron Lynch and Tom Crowley of OOIDA's Compliance Department. I'm Mark Reddick, and this is Landline Now. If you're running ultra-low sulfur diesel in your vehicle, make sure you are prepared and protected all winter long with Howe's Diesel Treat, the number one anti-gel product in North America from the 100-plus-year trusted brand Howe's Products. Truckdown.com. Whenever you have a breakdown, you need Truckdown.com. 24-7 access to 40,000 verified heavy-duty repair vendors nationwide. Repair secured. 
Load assured. Truckdown.com. Firestone tires are for more of everything, with more durability for more miles and more confidence in your fleet. Firestone's tested tires help fleets save with value where it matters most. Learn more at BridgestoneNationalFleet.com slash four more miles. Since you started, what you've loved about trucking is the freedom. Heading out on your favorite route, a good driving song, and thinking about truck insurance. Well, maybe not that last one. That's why we're here. At OOIDA, we have a full range of truck insurance products, expert advice, and great customer service, helping you get the right coverage for your operation. Go to OOIDA.com because your job is to drive. Our job is to help with everything else. California wants to take another stab at tamping down on the rising cost of fuel. Welcome back to Landline Now. We're going to cover that ongoing conversation in the Golden State with Keith Goble of Landline Magazine, and then we'll talk a bit about some transportation-related questions on the ballot in South Carolina next month. Keith, thanks for stopping by. Scott, thanks for having me. Are you enjoying the baseball playoffs yet? I am. As a Royals fan, I am enjoying it so far. It's Royals, yes. Very, yeah. very, very competitive this year. Plus, there's uh, multiple California teams that are still involved oh, in the playoffs. Nice segue there, Keith. Yes. Uh, let's let's talk about <laughs> California a little bit. Not not baseball necessarily here, but uh, Governor Gavin Newsom there calling on the legislature to do something about rising fuel costs. Uh, as I kind of alluded to earlier, he has done this before and he's doing it again. Catch us up to speed there. Yeah, I, I, it's not an annual thing for him, but it is it kind of turned into a an issue, a topic of, of regular uh, trying to address uh, concerns about that in California. Uh, a very, I guess you could say it's a complex issue in California, uh, depending on on who's uh, talking about the about the issue. But but yeah, you know, for for Gavin Newsom, uh, a year ago uh, had legislation that was signed into law uh, targeting uh, refiners. Belief being that they were uh, responsible for price gouging and, and and looking to put in rules to discourage that uh, financially for the most part. But uh, as far as, as the governor is concerned, looking to hold those folks accountable, those operations. Um, interesting. You know, you know California uh, recently wrapped up the regular session uh, for 2024. Uh, before they wrapped it up, uh, Governor Newsom had asked – politely, if you want to say, <laughs> okay. uh, had asked the leaders of his own party in charge of both legislative chambers to uh, bring up, to address uh, a concern about oil refineries, wanting to put in place some new requirements for oil refineries, which they did not do. So in response to that, he convened a special session to address his concerns about oil refineries uh, there in the state. And it's no secret. I mean, everybody knows California's fuel prices are, I think it's safe to say, the highest in the nation for a number of reasons. Uh, just for reference here, as we're kind of talking about all of this, um, and I know you did the research on this, can you kind of walk us through what the tax rate looks like there in California um, and just, I guess, what they're trying to do here with this uh, possible change that they're talking about. Yeah, starting with the latter, uh, you know, they're wanting to address most, most specifically uh, fuel price spikes. Uh, the belief being, uh, you know, with, with these oil refineries being responsible for increases in, in fuel costs. Uh, Newsom wanting these oil refineries to maintain a minimum, have a requirement to maintain a minimum uh, supply inventory. Uh, as he described it um, when he put out his news release uh, uh, convening this special session, is that they have price spikes whenever uh, they don't have adequate you know, backfilling of supplies, uh, when they go down for maintenance, then results in higher costs because they're down for a period of time. But, hey, you know, I mean, obviously we've reported it here and you've got uh, truck drivers who travel in or through California that have noticed for quite some time that, you know, fuel prices are pretty darn expensive there. Yeah. Uh, well above the national average, 
what I think recently uh, saw that um, the diesel is like a dollar twenty above the national average. Mm-hmm. Gas, the average gas, it's it's uh, over a dollar thirty above the national average. Is that because there are occasional uh, uh, maintenance times for these uh, refiners? Uh, that's yeah, it's that's arguable. Um, but one of the other some of the other points that have been made about this as far as why why are, are fuel costs so expensive in, in California, um, you know, the state links gas and diesel to inflation. So on an annual basis, every July, uh, they have they have increases. Uh, so that that is one component to it. Uh, another one is uh, they have carbon taxes that are that are put in place there, and then they have their cap and trade program, which, Obviously, the the idea from the state being that you're going to charge uh, those uh, those operations that exceed uh, 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 carbon amounts, and in an effort to deter them from being uh, over over the over the limits that are in place. But as we're aware, you know, those companies are going to look to recoup that cost at some some point somehow, and that yeah. typically is at the pump. So. Uh, there are multiple factors involved here, uh, and I know folks are very well aware of that, but the latest here in California is that uh, the governor is wanting to continue to focus on oil refineries there in the state and looking to put in place, a again, that requirement that they have, these oil refineries have, uh, that they maintain a minimum supply inventory. And real quick here before we move on to South Carolina um, – there are varying opinions about this plan out there. Uh, I know the governors of Arizona and Nevada have kind of pushed back on them a little bit. Uh, and the Republican um, uh, caucus in the California Assembly is also expressing concerns. Can you kind of um, just tell us briefly what those concerns are uh, as they pertain to this plan here? Yeah, you know, the governors of Arizona and Nevada, uh, yeah, uh, their concern is that this – Maintaining a minimum supply inventory is going to result because they, you know, largely get their fuel from California, if not all of it. That it's going to result in higher fuel prices for consumers in their states. So they're uh, they're very apprehensive about this. Uh, yeah, in the in the state house, as you might expect, uh, Republicans there in the minority in both chambers have their own ideas as far as what they could do to address high fuel costs, such as suspending the fuel tax is one option that has is, is being brought up again uh, and. Uh, Address addressing over uh, regulation uh, there in the state, which we shall see. But yeah, some of some of the concerns that have been have been brought up on on this particular effort. We'll keep an eye on that, or I guess you'll keep an eye on that and, and keep us updated on what happens there. If anything, let's uh, shift here to election day, November fifth. We have been covering some of the ballot questions related to transportation in several states and counties and cities. Uh, before Keith. And today it's South Carolina's turn. We've got voters in a number of counties being asked a few questions, I guess. What stands out to you there? Yeah, you know, probably earlier this summer, uh, talked about some of the South Carolina counties that uh, are going to have transportation questions on their ballot. You know, South Carolina and as we were talking about California, those are really the two, the two states that have on an annual basis the most uh, locale, cities, counties that have transportation related questions on their ballots. And, and this year in South Carolina, uh, no, no different. There are six different counties, some of the largest counties there in the state that have transportation questions on their ballot. Uh, South Carolina law, it permits counties to implement a transportation sales tax. It can be up to 1%. Uh, it has to be approved by a public vote. Uh, so you've got counties that have have uh, uh, taxes in place or looking to renew them or to add them. Uh, when we talk about how significant is this, well, the the state's three largest counties, uh, Greenville, Charleston, and, and Richland County, they're all asking voters this year uh, to approve uh, transportation tax, whether it be for up to 25 years, um, uh, raising potentially billions of dollars for, for projects that would include highways, roads, streets, bridges, transit, other transportation-related projects. Uh, just uh, yeah, uh, definitely. Uh, transportation is a one of those uh, those big items uh, that are going to be on local ballots uh, around the state of uh, South Carolina. Yeah, I'm curious to see how all these transportation questions across the nation kind of play out here because uh, history tells us 
they generally pass for the most part, but yeah. we've had inflation, uh, inflationary pressures. Mm-hmm. We've had the infrastructure law already, uh, you know, fixing roads and bridges across the nation. So I'm curious to see how those two things kind of play into, uh, you know, how voters look at the issue here on November 5th. And we will wait and see on that as well. We're about a month away. Keith, uh, we appreciate your time as always. And we'll talk to you again soon. Go Royals. <laughs> there you go. Our thanks to Keith Goble of Landline Magazine for his time today. And our thanks to you for yours. That is our show for today. Thanks for tuning in. And we hope to see you again soon. Thanks for listening. Be sure to like and subscribe. If you want more content, go to landline.media to get updated news, information, and archived editions of our show. Once again, that's landline.media. I'm a dad. A son. A husband. Wife. I'm a writer. Photographer. I farm. I'm a veteran. I love old cars. Fishing. My kids. Chrome. And I am. I am. I am a professional truck driver. And together, we are OOIDA. OOIDA was founded by truckers to stand up and speak on behalf of truckers. We've done that by combining the individual voices of our members into a single, powerful voice. Protecting your interests, defending your rights. Join us. Make your voice heard. Join OOIDA, the owner-operator independent drivers association. Call 1-800-444-5791 or visit OOIDA.com.